being a, a good quorum. So to everyone who is um, online on Zoom, as well as some of our faculty who are uh, in person in K069, welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. This is the first Grand Rounds where we've had the option for in-person meeting in, gosh, almost a year and a half. Um, for those who may have missed it, we did send out several emails to let everyone know uh, that as of this month, we will have uh, an option of both uh, in-person and virtual uh, grand rounds uh, for our monthly meetings. Um, so barring, barring new changes, uh, that will be also the case for our September uh, grand rounds as well. Um, so I wanted to welcome everyone this morning. Uh, we're grateful that uh, we have both options. Um, this morning, our speaker is Dr. Rebecca Peterson. Uh, I think she is, is not a stranger to most of us. Uh, Dr. Peterson um, came to us from Duke University to do a fellowship in 2009 uh, in advanced laparoscopic surgery and in 2011 joined our faculty. Uh, she has been a real key member uh, in uh, getting up and running our hernia center, which is based at Northwest. Um, she has uh, been extensively involved uh, in education as well, being one of our associate program directors for the general surgery residency program uh, based at Northwest and also heavily involved in student education. Um, she is going to share with us today uh, her expertise in hernias, which I will personally say I greatly appreciate as she came and helped me with a difficult case uh, most of the day yesterday. So Dr. Peterson, thank you so much for joining us and also for uh, being there for our very first in-person Grand Rounds in quite some time. Um, just at the end, um, I'll, I'll moderate chat, Rebecca. Thanks, Dr. McGrett. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction, by the way, and welcome virtually and uh, in person. I have Dr. Wood in front of me, like two feet away as my oh, audience, more than, <laughs> more than six feet away. Um, so uh, it's a real honor to be uh, presenting on the ever changing field of hernia surgery. And I'm sorry for the... Uh, I'm gonna to have to click on my slides individually. So no presentation view, because we've tried it like 20 times and it's not working, but I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. Uh, the learning object objectives are to review the evolution of hernia repair approaches and techniques, uh, consider specific aspects of individualization of repair and discuss current trends in repair and assessment of outcomes. So as you guys know, I mean, there's, it's definitely a common problem. There's over 2 million laparotomies performed in the United States each year, and a high proportion of these patients uh, go on to uh, develop an incisional hernia, making this one of the most common general surgery procedures being performed annually. Uh, unfortunately, re the recurrence risk remains high, and it's really dependent on uh, patient risk factors and uh, the duration of follow-up uh, of the study. But in short, uh, patients do go on to develop recurrent hernias, which result in subsequent operations, which places them at higher risk of complications and thus recurrence. And this is a, a big burden on our healthcare system. There's a very broad spectrum of patients type and size of defects and surgical approaches, uh, laparoscopic, robotic, open, hybrid, and various techniques. In the past, we basically focused on patching the defect and over the last decade are realizing the importance and respecting the abdominal wall and really are trying to achieve uh, regain of function and physiology. Uh, there's no single approach technique or type of mesh uh, that is ideal and these really should be individualized to the patient. The overall goal of the repair should be to really prevent recurrence, reduce complications, and most importantly, improve patient satisfaction. Uh, the overview of my talk is as follows, which was discussed in the learning objectives. So currently there are four possible approaches. You have robotic laparoscopic open and hybrid. There's five possible mesh placement positions three different or more component separation techniques and four fix, fixation options. So this, as you can see, results in numerous uh, variations of technique. These uh, of course should be individualized to the hernia characteristics, specifically size and location of the defect, tissue integrity, size of the hernia sac, uh, 
uh, skin issues and, 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 the, and more specifically looking at the width of the recti muscles on CT imaging and other variables should be considered as well as patient characteristics. So most importantly, when the patient's in your clinic, really what is the goal of repair? Um, you want to, at the end of the day, if the patient's most concerned about their large bulge, if that's not eliminated, eliminated, they're not going to be satisfied. So is it pain? Is it risk of strangulation? So getting to the bottom of what their goal and matching it with your type of repair is really important. And then, of course, taking into consideration body habitus. What is their BMI? What are their comorbidities, risk factors? And then really uh, working uh, hard to get a knowledge of their prior surgery, specifically hernia repairs. Where was their mesh placed previously? Was a myofascial release? Uh, performed. And these are all factors that should be taken into consideration for preoperative planning. So there's real no definition of um, abdominal wall reconstruction. Um, but I think most of us can agree that it's a ventral hernia repair uh, that basically involves a myofascial release. And there's various options that we'll discuss in detail. Not all of the options are listed here, but these are the most commonly thought of options where you have intraperitoneal mesh placement with an external oblique release, or we call it an anterior component separation, onlay mesh with an external oblique release, uh, retrorectus position of the mesh with an external oblique release, and so on. And we'll get into these in the subsequent slides. So the term component separation is really a heterogeneous term and really means a separation of parts. And to review the anatomy of the abdominal wall, as most of you know, you have the recti in the midline and then laterally you have the external oblique, internal oblique, innermost layer being the transversus abdominis muscle. So here you have the arcuate line, which is midway between your umbilicus and symphysis pubis. And then what's important about this landmark is the posterior sheath changes in its makeup where it's fused with the internal oblique and transversalis fascia. Uh, superiorly and inferiorly, you only have the transversalis fascia. And so it's really important to have a good understanding of the anatomy uh, when you're performing uh, component separation. So, uh, Previously described by uh, Dr. Ramirez back in the 1990s, where he where it was first introduced, uh, the component separation method was really uh, aimed at uh, moving the fascial and muscular layers toward the midline after performing lateral fasciotomies to close larger defects without the utilization of a prosthetic. And here, as originally described, you can see the picture on the left where you see an external oblique release and you can see the release of tension. You gain about eight centimeters on each side in the mid abdominal region. And this, this original technique required dissection, as you can see, pretty extensive where you go beyond the semilunar line and perform these fasciotomies and then you're able to close without tension in the midline. Um, but you can see that you, you do release a lot of tension with this technique. So the technique, uh, unfortunately, eliminates all the blood supply and requires a lot of subcutaneous dissection, which comes with, you know, definitely a higher risk of wound morbidity. Uh, so modifications that have been made over time, the initial one being to, you know, preserving the perforators in the peri umbilical region. And this, there's been studies to show that this decreased wound complications. More recently, um, or not too recently, is the open minimally invasive technique where you have a creation of these lateral transverse incisions on either side of the midline uh, incision. And then you, you can use lighted deeper retractors to develop subcutaneous tissues laterally and perform the external oblique through these smaller incisions and thus further reducing wound morbidity and also uh, eliminating uh, cross-contamination of these subcutaneous tunnels with the midline incision. As time went on, uh, the, the external oblique uh, release can be performed endoscopically. This was much more popular five to six years ago, where it's basically using the same equipment that I use, not everyone with the balloon dissector when, dissector when you're performing laparoscopic TEP repairs, where you basically go in between the internal oblique and external oblique initially, which eliminates the subcutaneous dissection altogether, so further reducing wound morbidity. Um, so I'll show you a video of a patient in the distant past of mine 
This is the balloon dissector being placed in between the external oblique and internal oblique muscles, creating that space, then being removed. Then you have the insufflation and creation of the space. So on the roof is the external oblique muscle and on the floor is the internal oblique. And you're looking towards the patient's pelvis uh, during this video. Uh, so after the additional five millimeter port comes in laterally, uh, you're going to see, uh, here's the linea, linea semilunaris and approximately two centimeters lateral to that, you'll see the division of the external oblique musculature and uh, aponeurosis. And it's a nice depiction of how much release you really get uh, with the anterior component separation. And so this incision is carried all the way down uh, to the, the pubis essentially, and then you're gonna carry it up over the costal margin um, just as you would do <clears throat> uh, open to really gain that release, especially if you have a higher up uh, defect. And with this release, uh, typically drains aren't placed, um, but it's a nice tool to have and um, was much more utilized before uh, introduction of more uh, posterior component separation, which we're gonna talk about subsequently. So. Um, speaking of the next myofascial release technique would be the posterior rectus sheath release. Uh, so this is an initial step before going uh, deeper with their dissection to perform a transversus abdominis release, which we'll, I'll show you both. So the initial step here is to get into the retrorectus space, making an incision in your posterior sheath, developing the retrorectus space to near the neurovascular bundles. It's not worth doing these repairs if you um, you injure these neurovascular bundles and lose the function of your rectus muscles. So these need to be preserved. And then uh, prior to deciding whether your patient truly needs a formal transversus abdominis release, you can perform a posterior sheath release and you can gain approximately two to three centimeters on either side and then really decide whether a deeper dissection is necessary which is revealed in this slide. So same, same steps. And then uh, after the posterior sheath release, uh, just medial to the neurovascular bundles, you see the transversus abdominis muscle, uh, which is divided. And then you basically either have transverse salus fascia or peritoneum, and it's a really thin layer. And, and that allows you to put in a, a non-composite mesh widely in that space. So now that we, we've kind of talked about the various options for uh, component separation or myofascial release, so what are, what are all the various positions that we can place our mesh? Uh, these are five various posi positions. And as you can see, I'm kind of flipping back with our, the nomenclature and this is somewhat problematic of really reading operative notes and understanding what was done. So trying to be consistent with the language uh, is very helpful. So. Um, onlay mesh is here. So it's anterior or superficial to your, your anterior fascial layer. Uh, you have the retromuscular layer, which can be in the retrorectus space. And if you perform a posterior component separation, it can go wider um, all, all the way in the, what you would refer to as retromus retromuscular to the near the psoas muscles. And then the preperitoneal position um, has become more popular over time followed by the intraperitoneal uh, position. So the, the onlay position of the mesh, the advantages of that is pretty much it's straightforward. Um, potentially avoids peritoneal entry, but most of the time the peritoneum is entered. What's advantageous about it, the patient's had more repairs and significant amount of adhesions, it prevents that um, excessive need to clear the abdominal wall. Um, the, the issue with this repair is that it requires, again, subcutaneous dissection, and that comes with a higher risk of wound morbidity as you, you take that blood supply. Uh, this definitely has its place uh, in more challenging cases that have had multiple prior repairs. Um, a meta-analysis, basically looking at sublay versus onlay. Uh, for incisional hernias, uh, you can see that the pulled odds ratio favors 
more of the sublay approach as opposed to the onlay in regards to surgical site infection. And this is uh, the same study shows a similar favorable outcome for sublay or retro, I should use consistent language, retro rectus or retromuscular repair for hernia recurrence. Another study um, looking at sublay where the, the reference uh, position is onlay basically shows that the, uh, the least favorable op option is your inlay uh, repair, which um, is a bridged repair. So an inlay mesh is least favorable and the, the most favorable again is, is the sublay, um, again, compared to the, the um, intraperitoneal uh, position. So speaking of intraperitoneal position, um, uh, the laparoscopic approach has been very popular and we refer to it as laparoscopic eye palm. We also, um, more recently, this is being performed robotically, um, but it stands for intraperitoneal onlay of mesh. So it's somewhat confusing. Um, and in these, in these repairs, the, the advantages, of course, decrease wound morbidity, but if, the, if it's a bigger defect and it's not closed, uh, there's mesh eventration, which may or may not be optimal for the patient, depending on what they wanted uh, from the repair. Um, also, if the defect's not clo closed, there's also data to suggest that the, the formation of seroma is higher. Um, but if with defect closure and smaller defects, it's definitely a, a nice repair that results in less wound morbidity. And so to look at the physics of hernia repair, uh, the larger the defect, <clears throat> we, we aim for a five centimeter overlap in most of our uh, repairs. And as the defect increases, the force that's going against the, the mesh position to displace the mesh increases exponentially. So looking at a, a meta-analysis and there, there are more, uh, this is the most recent one looking at six randomized clinical controlled trials, looking at laparoscopic uh, versus open and again in incisional hernia repair, not primary ventral hernia repair, but basically shows uh, that of these trials with variable follow-up, the, the outcomes are essentially similar. Uh, the laparoscopic repair uh, was noted to have an increased risk of uh, inadvertent bowel uh, complications. Uh, and when looked at individually, again, showed more favorable seroma wound infection uh, development. Although there's no uh, patient, you know, data to really say, you know, are there more adhesions with the intraperitoneal position of the mesh uh, versus an extraperitoneal position of the mesh, <clears throat> that study would be difficult to achieve. I think it, it, it's reasonable to assume that would be the case, given you have um, direct uh, direct exposure of the mesh to your intraabdominal viscera. And again, this is assuming that when you place the mesh in the retromuscular position or preperitoneal position, that you do so without um, rents in your peritoneum or your posterior sheath. So when patients come into clinic, um, there's a lot of discussion about uh, mesh and complications of mesh. It's been highly, it's been widely publicized on various forms of social media and other forms. It's, it takes longer in clinic when you really get into the details of mesh. And so a lot of patient education is necessary. Um, and when you, you talk about uh, intraperitoneal position of the mesh, again, it, it is reasonable to assume that you're gonna have a higher risk of mesh erosion into bowel. Um, this is a, on the left, uh, this, this is somewhat of a tortoise shell that I took out of a patient uh, where he didn't have a recurrence, he didn't have an infection, um, but this was, he had pain tying his shoe, shoelaces. So this came out as a, a tortoise shell. So there definitely are uh, cases where mesh has been explanted and we truly don't know uh, the true incidence of explants. Uh, but this is being captured in post-marketing uh, registry studies. This is a case I did with uh, Dr. Denzel Wood on Monday, um, where we took out uh, chronically infected mesh with uh, microdata, significant for uh, clostridium. Um, so this is a healthcare worker that really had been suffering with systemic uh, symptoms every time she came off her suppressive antibiotics. And so 
Um, this shows you the type of mesh used here um, definitely was not gonna clear the infection. And uh, it, it had delaminated and had multiple layers and really was adherent uh, in the intra-abdominal position as well as kind of some of the retrorectus position, but we were able to gain access into the retrorectus space um, there was some tension, uh, tension on realignment of the recti in the midline, so we decided to perform a posterior sheath release and not uh, a deeper dissection with a, a formal transversus abdominis uh, muscle release. So, um, speaking of mesh complications, um, this was a, a patient that shortly after my fellowship. Um, I did a uh, laparoscopic eye palm on this patient, moderately sized defect, high risk of infection. At the time, we weren't being aggressive about closing uh, defects, but definitely developed a large seroma, uh, persisted three months, and I kind of bit the bullet and had interventional radiology drain it. Unfortunately, it became infected space and infected the mesh. And so, this resulted in removal of the mesh laparoscopically and then later after our optimization, she underwent an abdominal wall reconstruction. So really what is the ideal approach and position of mesh? Um, it, in my mind, it would be one with low morbidity, a low recurrence risk, uh, a, a smaller incisions, and presumably extra peritoneal uh, position of the mesh. Again, there's not a lot of evidence currently, but if you could prevent adhesions, uh, I feel that you'd have um, less uh, complications at subsequent operations. Um, there's a high risk that regardless, regardless if it's another hernia repair or an abdominal operation, there is an extra component when you have a piece of mesh uh, in that, with that operation. Um, but if you can achieve some of these, these principles, uh, in my mind, that would be the ideal uh, repair. Now with uh, the robotic platform becoming much more popular, I think that it's allowed um, different positions of, of the mesh from a minimally invasive approach. Um, this is a single dock approach where that is used where you place supports either lower down or higher up in the abdomen for these uh, suprapubic or epigastric defects and are able to get into the retro uh, rectus space uh, with an incision either higher up or lower down, this case being lower down, um, and then developing that retro rectus space uh, for mesh uh, placement. And uh, of course, this is, this is difficult to do laparoscopically. And so I think with the, the higher use of the robot, uh, you're seeing more of these types of repairs. So this is showing getting into the retrorectus space. And then of course you see the fusion in the, the midline. And as you go up, you'll see that the, uh, the defect uh, being exposed. So here's closure of the posterior sheath on the floor here um, prior to formal defect closure. And then here's the defect closure uh, on on the roof here. And then further closure of the posterior sheath. The mesh is brought in after kind of meticulous measurement. So you're not oversizing or undersizing your mesh. It, 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 it will cover the entire potential space. And then um, mattress sutures being placed for securing. It doesn't require many securing sutures because it's a closed space and then closure of the posterior sheath, the initial incision that was made. Another um, robotic approach is a double dock uh, approach where you have three ports on either side of the abdomen. And this would be performed in a technique that's more similar to how you would perform it from an open approach. And so this image shows you gaining access in the posterior sheath just off the midline, like we saw with the open approach and then the hernia defect being in the midline. Uh, the inferior image shows the development of the retrorectus space and preservation of the neurovascular bundles. Here's a video of that entry 
that again is very similar <clears throat> to the open approach and specifically with the minimally invasive approach, you don't wanna cut yourself short um, with the length of the posterior sheath um, when you suture together to, pre to really prevent tension uh, on the closure. So I'll move on because a, a similar video is now um, going to show more of a robotar where it would be uh, gaining doing those same steps, but then going on to perform a transversus abdominis release. And this video is a very nice video that I brought from um, Dr. Jeremy Warren in Greenville. He's doing a randomized trial uh, of open versus uh, uh, robo, what we refer to as robotar. Um, and looking at the outcomes for <clears throat> very specific patient risk factors and size of defects. And so this is obviously is speeded up. So gaining access immediately into the retro rectus space, carrying the dissection laterally, preserving the uh, neurovascular bundles, and then making an incision in the posterior sheath, just medial to these neurovascular bundles. And I think this is a nice display of uh, the underlying transversus abdominis muscle being divided and you can see the, the release here. And then once that's done, you could either close a defect, bringing in the mesh, closing the posterior sheath, and then like you saw earlier, closing the defect, and then uh, having the mesh well positioned in the entire potential space that was developed. And it's important to <clears throat> when you do the, the inferior dissection, really to get into the space of retsis and then superiorly um, to really go uh, higher up to prevent these suprapubic or um, subxiphoid recurrences, which are difficult to fix. So um, a newer technique that was introduced by uh, Igor Belansky and, and previously by Jorge Deas um, with the inguinal approach, but it's it's an extended or enhanced view of the totally extra pre-peritoneal approach. And so this is, he, he did it laparoscopically. He's a pretty gifted laparoscopic surgeon, but I think the robot uh, has made it easier for others uh, to perform, which is basically gaining access, kind of like we were talking about with the endoscopic uh, external release, but you gain access directly into the retro rectus position with an optical trocar. And then, but to do this, you really need to have a, a, a clear understanding of your patient's body habitus and anatomy uh, based upon physical examination and imaging uh, so that you don't have the feared complication of injuring uh, the linea semilunaris, which you can create a difficult to fix lateral hernia. So I think it's important to have a good understanding of your specific patient's anatomy. Um, here's a, a depiction of this. Uh, where you gain access retro into that retroactive position and then cross the midline and divide the contralateral posterior sheath at the medial aspect. So here's, here's this being done initially laparoscopically with the hook electrocautery, dividing the posterior sheath once you're in that space. And then here you can see you're crossing the midline and gaining access uh, to the contralateral posterior sheath at the medial edge of the rectus. And then you carry on that dissection and are, are, are in that plane to begin with. And then can perform either a retro rectus repair <clears throat> and move on to do a posterior sheath release and if needed a transversus abdominis muscle release. So here you can see the hook cautery being used to divide that contralateral posterior sheath. 
So, you know, the when to do what technique, specifically as all, all of these uh, are being introduced, really what is best for each, each scenario. So I think the patient selection criteria that you want to think about, obviously the image on the right, it's a huge hernia with skin breakdown. That's, the, that's definitely going to be uh, require excessive skin excision. There makes, it doesn't make sense to do a minimally invasive approach with that patient. Uh, the picture on the left, you can see it's a smaller bulge uh, with good integrity of the skin. Um, so defect size is important. Uh, looking at imaging uh, preoperatively and really determine, determining what the recti look like, what's the width, what are the patient's risk factors, would they benefit from a minimally invasive approach, um, are they exceedingly high risk of uh, uh, surgical site infection and subsequent mesh infection? Uh, again, what does their skin look like? And really, most importantly, what, what does the patient want? What is their biggest concern? And uh, really aiming your approach and technique at, at the patient's goal, again, being reasonable uh, with their prior repairs and anatomy and risk factors. So it's sorry that the, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, my animation's not working, but uh, the point of this is to uh, look at um, various cases uh, and, and talk about various approaches, basically getting into individualization of, of care. So um, the, this is a 33-year-old active, healthy woman with a 15-centimeter defect that comes to your clinic. She has beautiful recti, and you can see laterally uh, the three muscle layers. Um, I would offer her an open approach. She's going to want excision of her excessive skin um, and realignment of the recti in the midline, mid, uh, midline uh, to restore the function. And then I think, uh, given the size of the defect, um, it, it would be nice to have her uh, a wide piece of mesh uh, placed in the retromuscular uh, position. Um, let me see if I can move some of these out of the way. So here's a patient um, that basically has a moderately sized defect that has had multiple prior repairs, a BMI of 34, diabetic. Um, and most importantly, the, the, uh, the prior repair uh, included a retro rectus repair. So your retro rectus space has been uh, uh, obliterated and, and not easy to re-enter. So in a case like this, I still think it's really important to have various options and you could perform an uh, endoscopic external oblique release if needed, uh, probably given the size of the defect that, that is required in the multiple recurrences this patient had and put the mesh uh, in an intraperitoneal uh, position, which may be difficult with uh, extensive lysis of adhesions. Um, you can do an open approach uh, with an external oblique release to avoid uh, excessive extensive uh, adhesiolysis and, and think about an online repair. We know it's not perfect, but in this type of patient, again, it's good to have options. Um, this patient, you know, is someone that had a primary uh, hernia that grew over time. He's schizophrenic and lost to medical care, obviously shows up as an inpatient uh, on our service. And um, after optimization, he really couldn't tolerate anything PO. He had no real intraperitoneal organs except his pancreas um, in the correct position. And so he obviously with reduction of these, uh, with the amount of reduction is gonna require some sort of release. And so this, this approach, I, I would, it's kind of straightforward on his case is gonna require excessive skin excision. So an open approach, again, probably with the transversus abdominis, uh, muscle release and placement of a, a wide uh, coverage mesh in the retromuscular position. And I, I just thought he was interesting because he had uh, such a bad uh, problem with the inability to eat and it really took him a, a while to uh, eat afterwards. But uh, this is the interoperative uh, pictures and requiring most of uh, his bowel in a bowel bag to even uh, do the surgery. Um, this is showing kind of the importance of going really high up uh, where you take down both the posterior sheaths uh, just beneath the linea alba and getting into the fatty triangle um, prior to uh, placing the mesh in that retromuscular position. Um, again, you know, after a long operation, I, I owe Dr. Wright grief because he walked in the OR energetically and criticized my crooked uh, 
incision there. Um, but this patient, interestingly, he had a polypropylene macroporous mesh plates in the retromuscular position. We actually had to do a peg on him because uh, it took a while for him uh, to recover from a severe gastric outlet obstruction. And surprisingly, uh, his mesh was fine. Uh, there was never uh, any mesh infectious complications and we followed him up beyond a year. Um, this again, animation not working, uh, is a obese patient, diabetic, uh, in in multiple episodes of incarceration, hospitalization for small bowel obstructions, uh, moderately sized defects. So I think that you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with the IPOM repair, despite, you know, the popularity of the extra peritoneal position uh, that's increasing, that's an increasing trend. Um, another kind of example of where, you know, again, there, there's various options that I'm sure all of you are thinking beyond what I'm presenting, but these are some that come to my mind when, when looking at the CT scans and talking to the patients about their goals. So 38 year old, otherwise active, healthy male, no complex prior history. Uh, I think this patient, patient would be reasonable to think about a, a robo tar. And, and really when I say tar, really always trying to do a posterior sheath release and, and really determining whether a, a deeper dissection is necessary. Um, an open approach, of course, uh, with the same uh, technique uh, would be what I would be considering in that patient. Um, this is a not as large defect, but again, in an otherwise kind of healthy uh, patient, no complex past surgical history, uh, the defects higher up. So you could do a, a trans, single doc trans abdominal um, approach uh, and do a retrorectus repair. Um, and with or without uh, an official uh, transversus abdominis release. Uh, if you're uh, comfortable with your skill set, and I think this would be a reasonable uh, ETEP approach, um, would be a good uh, patient uh, for that, as well as, again, a, an open retrorectus uh, approach uh, with the same uh, myofascial re release consideration. So with these cases and the numerous variations of approaches and techniques, I think uh, this is where collaboration becomes exceedingly important um, under the directorship of Dr. Andrew Wright, um, really literally speaking is the gorilla glue, as you can see his famous gorilla story of, uh, of really connecting all of our campuses and, and joining a, and having, having a really fun group where the silver linings of COVID we've started meeting uh, multi-campus and really discussing these challenging and interesting cases and, and various options. And there's a lot of collaboration um, with us scrubbing in with each other. Um, I think also what's come out of this collaboration and his directorship is uh, the development of the, the ERAS protocols. And it's one thing to develop them and put them in place, but it's, it's another thing to continually optimize these pathways as guidelines change. Um, we've kind of gone from epidurals to now taps and, you know, there's a lot that needs to be changed and, and having meetings and having group discussions about these options and uh, forthcoming evidence uh, is, is a dynamic process. Um, again, I, the collaborations, we, we, we put on live uh, courses at Harborview and, and appreciate uh, collaboration with the hernia course is again, much more common before uh, the pandemic. And then I think there's been a significant amount of, of uh, savings, uh, financially speaking with mesh consolidation across campuses uh, that required a lot of meetings there. And then I think as a department, uh, we've uh, established uh, preoperative uh, principles uh, regarding optimization in regards to, you know, are we operating on smokers, poorly controlled diabetics, uh, BMI is greater than 40. Um, I think uh, we all have, uh, have similar principles uh, in that regard. And it's it's really comes from this uh, multi-campus collaboration. Um, this is, uh, speaking of a preoperative optimization of principles, this is uh, uh, Dr. McQuart and, and, and myself yesterday at the VA um, she got her patient to lose 100 pounds uh, prior to this uh, multiple uh, recurrent 
midline and large peristomal hernia. So uh, not only did she get the patient to lose 100 pounds, it wasn't, I think in these kind of cases uh, from our discussion when we're operating is, you know, the patient comes, they're not ready for surgery. It's not it's not favorable to the patient. You're not doing them any good as to say, I'm not fixing you until you lose weight. You know, it really takes a lot of uh, effort and education. And, and she checked on this patient every three months. Uh, and this patient lost 100 pounds. Amazing. And uh, got a nice repair yesterday from Dr. Marquardt. So uh, collaboration also is very important in our clinic uh, settings. Um, I think uh, really get, getting buy-in from the staff in regards to patient education and then uh, synchronization of preoperative and postoperative uh, protocols uh, has been really important. Uh, we have Michelle Legaya that really has helped us implement this with our staff and made it a steam, uh, streamlined process, uh, which has taken a lot of effort and time. But it, once you get there, it's been it's been really. Uh, beneficial to our patients. Uh, our group is really uh, bought in to becoming a part of the ACHQC, which stands for the Abdominal Core Health Quality Collaborative. Uh, this is a collaborative that started by uh, Dr. Rosen and Dr. Palouse approximately eight to 10 years ago and has become um, more popular over time. Currently, there, we, the National Registry has 82,000 patients in the database. And you can see there's 468 surgeons contributing to that database. And what's unique about this database that I think is, is, is something that can, we can really take advantage of from a research standpoint is the granular data of all the operative details. Um, and as trends uh, change, really capturing what, what surgeons are doing um, in regards from ETEP to preperitoneal placement of MASH to open um, and devices that they're using, meshes that they're using, and that the FDA has really become interested in this, this database and showing up to board meetings, um, wanting to use this database as a post-marketing uh, hernia device uh, surveillance. Um, I think the collaborative is just not a database. It also um, has a big initiative with opioid reduction and, and teaching. Um, we also have monthly webinars where our group is uh, involved in. Uh, Dr. Yates recently put on um, the patient advocacy uh, kind of mesh uh, fear uh, webinar. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of interesting topics. We, we try to get our residents uh, to attend these uh, when, they're, uh, when they're rotating with us. Um, what I think is nice in clinic, uh, this app has been developed, uh, which I think uh, applies to not just hernia repair, but any patient with a large abdominal uh, surgery, uh, where it really has done a nice job. The Ohio State has a, a fantastic physical therapy department and so this app, when the patients are in clinic, I have them download this or when I'm rounding on them in the hospital. Um, it's just a, a bunch of exercises that you can do to get ready for surgery in regards to abdominal core health and uh, at the time of surgery, the day of surgery, and then up to eight weeks after surgery. And so instead of just saying, hey, don't lift more than 25 pounds, which, you know, you know, or, you know the knee jerk response uh, in the post-operative instructions, um, this, this really gets at um, sensitivity of their incision and daily activities and what they can do. And I, I think it's, the patients love this. So I think it's something um, that's out there and that's really widely applicable to all major abdominal surgeries. Um, the next, uh, and it also saves time in clinic too, because you said just download this app and they can, they can spend time on that. Uh, there's also a, a preoperative prediction model um, that's real-time data coming from the ACHQC that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily what it spits out in risk, but it's going through with your patient and preoperative clinic as a visual where you can plan, you know, what risk factors do they have? Where do you plan on placing the mesh? What's the size of their defect? And then kind of showing the patient, you know, what, uh, talking about surgical site, occurrence, infection, readmission rate. And so again, it's a visual and it gets the patient to buy into their repair and, and uh, really part of the preoperative optimization uh, process. There's also another commonly used app that's a little scarier to patients. So if I have a patient that's somewhat resistant with higher risk factors, I use that, it's called the CDAR. Um, so, uh, 
we have become more consistent in um, contributing to the registry over the past two to three years after we've kind of streamlined the process. And so here's how many uh, patients we have in the database and the blue arrow just shows kind of the Northwest campus site there uh, in regards to all of the other sites. Uh, but we're excited that we're, we're finally uh, basically contributing all patients because we have them entered their demographic data entered at the time they're getting preoperative teaching. So there's, we know how many are in there. And if there's missing data, uh, it kind of eliminates the cherry picking uh, factor. So we're excited to uh, carry out research once we optimize follow-up in regards to patient reported out outcomes, which is part of this uh, collaborative and, and of course, surgeon reported outcomes. Um, as volumes have increased, uh, we uh, have been, uh, excited to really have a more robust curriculum in MIS, both laparoscopic and robotic. Um, uh, thanks to Dr. Jim Park, robotic, and, and Dr. Karen Horvath, robotic uh, curriculum is very much part of our residency education. Um, and I, we, we, you know, the hernia case is ideal for that uh, experience. And with our R2s and R3s uh, getting more consult time, uh, this is this is really a big shout out to uh, Dr. White, who really has made this um, her initiative, and and we all have supported and excited about this. Specifically, uh, Dr. Citrulo more recently, who's joined our group. Um, I think the graduated approach works, and uh, hopefully, when the residents are rotating over, uh, doing more complex robotic. Uh, uh, cases that that their skill set is noted and they're able to do more as they uh, became R4s and R5s. So I, I would like to thank um, Dr. Brant Oschlager really for his vision uh, 10 years ago um, after I finished my fellowship. He really had a strong vision of uh, this specialized uh, care and optimization um, and frequency of performing uh, these more complex techniques. Uh, he's brought uh, multiple surgeons, our group together. Um, I can't thank my partners enough. It's been really fun to optimize the center. And we are excited to push each other forward and really take advantage of the, the database and, and future studies and become more involved in these multi-center embedded studies in the ACHQC. So uh, with that, um, in summary, I think surgeons should really use their best judgment, and I really think it should be based upon your skill set and, and clinical needs of the patient. So I also strongly believe, like peripheral vascular disease to our vascular surgeons, um, that the ventral hernia is more of a chronic disease and should be viewed as that. And um, we know that as the interval increases, the risk of recurrence occurs, and I think that's kind of the discussion you kind of need to have with your patient. Um, and I think given that, um, you wanna give your patient the best repair possible to decrease the risk of recurrence, but you also want, don't want to prematurely utilize uh, abdominal wall reconstruction prematurely because uh, it will hamper uh, the options over time. Um, there's definitely an array of surgical approaches and techniques. Um, and I think these are necessary. I think they need to be studied, but I think they're necessary because Every patient's different and after multiple repairs, there's not a lot of options. So I think the more tools you have in the shed, the better, uh, more options are available for the patient if you're flexible and, and you really try to develop your, your skill set as, as, as more uh, innovation is being introduced. Um, again, studies are ongoing and I think we need to better understand the outcomes of these newer techniques and cost. And I think it's, it's, it's not there yet, um, but hopefully it will be forthcoming uh, as we start getting more robust follow-up on these patients long-term. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, Basically what I'll do is I'll open up chat uh, as well as uh, in-person questions for those uh, that are present with Dr. Peterson in K69. So I'll just let it get started. Seems like we have... Um... Dr. Marquardt, uh, uh, in the room, I, I have an in. Oh, Rebecca, can you turn on your mic? I, I can't hear Dr. Wood. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, so, Dr. Peterson, this was fantastic. Thank you for a great presentation and being courageous in your <laughs> in person presentation. Um, and I think I want to point out a couple of things. First, Anyone that says that hernia repairs are simple, you've made it. That's a clear <laughs> point that, that, that there is an enormous range of complexity there. And I just want to thank you and the others in the hernia center for the incredible uh, work that you do for patients uh, and call out the point that you made about collaboration. I'm excited to see the work across all of our campuses uh, with all of the surgeons involved. And I think. Uh, that is really important and, and really uh, a contribution of all of you that are dedicated to hernia surgery in terms of supporting other faculty and other problems that, that they should present with. My question, I'm sorry for maybe being naive, but it goes way back to, I think, maybe your third slide, which is, I'm still stuck on the huge incidence of mental hernias after laparotomy. You said it was 11 to 28 percent, and I had no idea that it was that high. Um, my question is, do you have a sense of the denominator of, of how many of those are relatively asymptomatic and never require repair versus those that end up in this chronic state, the potential series of repairs uh, that are increasingly complicated, like you described. That's a that's a really good question. I think it's multifactorial, and how many patients um, seek care for bulges after laparotomy? You know, I think it depends on uh, the patient if they're bothered by the bulge or pain. I I, I think it's an ex an enormous problem, and and one that knowing that it's a high risk, what can we do in the prophylactic uh, area of identifying these patients and, and thinking about maybe uh, utilizing prophylactic mesh uh, or different techniques to prevent incisional hernias. And one of those being more, um, you know, uh, the minimally invasive approach for some of our other procedures does decrease that risk significantly. Um, as laparotomies become, um, as minimally invasive surgery becomes more of an option for other procedures. I, I truly don't know. I, I think there's a lot of patients walking around with hernias that don't seek care. Uh, as you saw, you know, a, a nationally, it's 750,000 uh, repairs per year, uh, which is, besides gallbladder, is the most common procedure general surgeons perform. Um, I don't have a good answer to your question. I think that it does really raise the question of what can we do better uh, to prevent these incisional hernias? Because it's not just an incisional hernia. When they get a repair, you saw that it then is another cycle. Then, they need, then they're at high risk of recurrence. And then again, and so uh, at the end of the day, when you, you're in clinic and you have this patient with a, a, a very complex history and a large hernia, you ask them what their first surgery was, aside from a laparotomy, it, it was an umbilical hernia repair. And I think that's sad. Um, so I think that's where it's a balance between not overdoing their surgery when it's a little umbilical hernia, but not underdoing it as well. Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's a problem and one that needs to be addressed in multi, multi, multitude of facets with the prophylactic mesh and, and other techniques that we can do to really increase, to decrease the uh, incidence. Uh, Rebecca, there's a question from Dr. Olschlager. It says, um, for the general surgeon who has few, if any of these advanced tools in their kit, which techniques would you say are minimum if you're going to be doing ventral hernia repairs in 2021? Essentially, what's the range of patients you can, should consider taking on or perhaps refer to somebody who does more complex repairs? Well, that, that's a really good question. I, I, I think, you know, oh, yeah. uh, Brent, Dr. Brant Oschlager asked for the general surgeon uh, what techniques or repairs uh, 
should they would be recommended to perform for a patient with a hernia repair and, and what instances uh, would they consider referring to a specialized center? Um, and, and my question to that is I, I think anyone, I, I think the general surgeon does hernia repairs. I think it's really important to do a good hernia repair. I think there is nothing wrong uh, with the open approach um, if done well. And I think that when you do hernia repairs, there are certain principles with mesh overlap um, and preoperative optimization that should be adhered to. That should be number one. Now, when you get um, patients that are really seeking, um, you know, if you talk about inguinal um, and they want a laparoscopic repair and you don't do many, I think that that's a consideration where you either buy in that you want to do laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs and increase your, you know, get beyond the learning curve. Um, because I actually think that's a, a complex surgery in, in my really humble opinion. Um, and, um, or you, I think it depends on patient preference and then uh, complexity. And I think in some of these cases that have had prior myofascial releases, if you don't do a lot of myofascial releases, I think that um, doing them infrequently probably would not be uh, something I personally would do. I, 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 I send patients to specialized hernia uh, experts like, because I don't do primary tissue repair for inguinal hernias. So I'm not going to offer something to a patient that I do once or twice a year um, if I don't, if I feel like there's a, a center like the Shouldice Clinic or one of my partners that has taken a sole interest in doing a non-mesh repair uh, in the groin. So um, I think it really is dependent on the, the surgeon's skill set. And I think laparoscopy is part of a general surgeon's skill set. And, you know, there's, there's many uh, uh, skills that they can offer their patients that want minimally invasive surgery, I think. Uh, so I, I think in these more complex patients where you've burned bridges and they've already had a myofascial release, and um, I think the collaboration component is really uh, important. Um, now, if, and, and this is you know, definitely a big discussion point, but one to bring up, if you have patients that are really uh, savvy and they have diastasis recti and they, they have this hernia defect and they want a preperitoneal repair and, you know, things like that, again, um, the evidence is, is still lacking, but there are some skill sets that I think are needed to give that patient or a scenario um, the repair that may be optimal and may be the patient's preference. And I think that's when um, referring to someone that has taken a true interest in that would be uh, optimal. Uh, we have one, one final question. I'll kind of combine two. Uh, there were two questions about some special circumstances. Dr. Shalou mentioned patients with connective tissue disorders and perhaps you know, special needs when thinking about hernia repair. And Dr. Langdell mentioned, you know, what about patients with active Crohn's disease who are at least moderately well-managed? Would you consider using mesh given that they will likely need a resection in the future, let's say if they have a structure that's being medically managed? So how do you kind of think about some of these specialized circumstances? Yeah, um, to Dr. Sloot's point, um, with the connective tissue disorders, I mean, I think we've all feared these patients because we know that they come with extra complexities and higher risk of recurrence. And um, I think, uh, if they're getting surgeries for other reason, I think that's where prophylactic mesh comes into play uh, when doing hernia repair on these patients. Um, it becomes a discussion of, you know, kind of like your big flank hernia that you know if you, you put mesh, you can't really close the defect and they're just gonna have uh, eventration, you're, you're covering it with mesh and maybe causing more pain than the patient has. I think it really depends on the patient's problem. Like, does it interfere with their life? Uh, is it dangerous? Um, you know, so these discussions with these higher risk patients, I mean, it becomes a point where risk of recurrence, if a patient's sitting in front of you with a BMI of 40 and a poorly controlled diabetic, you know that their risk of complication is probably 80% according to my little risk calculator on my phone, or, you know, you know, it's high, you don't know the exact number, but, you know, is it responsible to take that patient to the OR? And that's when you have the discussion and like your patient who lost hundred pounds for you, um, Deb, the, we, we were joking in the OR that we were glad they had a hernia because that patient did more good optimizing 
their weight and patients with poorly di controlled diabetes than, than fixing the hernia. So, um, but that's a little bit different with Shireen's point about these connective tissue disorders. I, I, I think that you, we don't truly know what the recurrence risk is, but definitely it's higher and doing everything in your power um, to prevent recurrence in that specific scenario should be done. Um, in regards to uh, Dr. Langdell's uh, uh, discussion about uh, IBD disease, um, again, I think it depends on the scenario. I'm very pro um, extra peritoneal placement of mesh on these patients. Um, I don't use a lot of absorbable mesh these days, um, but I, I, I do, I do when I have these patients and they really want repair and we have discussion um, about future need for surgeries. Um, I really think in this scenario that putting the patient, put, putting the mesh in the retromuscular position is important or the, you know, preperitoneal position, but typically the, the retromuscular position. And, and I put uh, macropo macroporous polypropylene mesh in that nice muscular vascular space. And, um, they're on steroids and um, they're at high risk of uh, recurrence. And that comes with a lower uh, risk of recurrence and the same potential explant rate as a biologic mesh. So I think, I think again, it's a discussion and patient education and risk and benefit analysis with every patient you have sitting in front of you with these uh, known risk factors and risk of subsequent operations. Uh. I think we're, we're a little, just a hair over time, so we'll have to finish, but Dr. Peterson, thank you for a fantastic uh, presentation for enlightening us, and I think really highlighting the complex issue that is the hernia. Thank you.